I'm good. Excellent. Are either of you planning on sharing any video with sound? <laughs> no, no. I have a slideshow. No video. Okay. That's good. Uh, if, it had sound, if it had sound, it has special instructions, slideshows, or just share your screen. So we should be okay. And the order that I have you going in is Steve first, then Jack. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Okay. So I will uh, get us started by introducing Steve. After Steve does his presentation, I'll introduce Jack. The uh, Q&A is available if anybody in the audience has questions for either of our speakers. You're welcome to type those questions in. And then I will uh, read them at the, at the end and get responses. Because there are two speakers, we're going to aim for 20 minutes for each of you. Fair enough. Any questions? Okay. I then will start by introducing Steve Brisson. He's the director of the Mackinac State Historic Parks. He's a sixth generation native of the Upper Peninsula. That is some impressive Upper cred. I, I, am, I am very impressed. Um, received your BS in history from Northern Michigan University in 1989. And um, Steve has an MA from the Cooperstown Graduate Program in History Museum Studies in Cooperstown, New York. He's the author of six books on Mackinac history, including Picturesque Mackinac, the photographs of William H. Gardner from 1896 to 1915. And uh, according to my notes here, you have a book on Charlton, uh, forthcoming from Michigan State University Press. Correct. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, welcome, Steve, and uh, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay. Um, what I'm going to try to cover here is uh, give a um, brief introduction to Charlton, uh, some biographical data, how his career progressed and, and so on, and then launch into his uh, architecture and the, the styles that he worked in. I'm going to leave out of my presentation in-depth discussion of uh, the architectural profession and how Charlton uh, fit into it and, and so on. I think that's of uh, least interest usually to uh, general um, audiences, but if there are any questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer that uh, later on. Um, Charlton, um, he was Demetrius Frederick Charlton, but uh, not surprisingly, he didn't go by Demetrius. He was always known as Fred. To family, friends, professionally, it was Fred Charlton. And then um, formally, he was always D. Fred Charlton. Um, he was born and raised in England um, in the small village of Ingtham and uh, born there and then raised there and in the nearby village of Rotham. These are in Kent County, south of uh, uh, London. His um, mother was from a very prominent family in Ingtham. Um, they lived on a vast estate, uh, the house dating back to the 16th century. Um, his grandfather was Colonel Demetrius Grievous James. Um, and his mother fell in love with a tenant farmer on the estate, Thomas Charlton. Uh, much to the great distress of, of the colonel, uh, who, uh, first of all, uh, he forbade bad the marriage, but daughter Maria defied him and married Thomas anyway in the village church. And um, uh, shortly after that, Thomas Charlton inherited a great fortune from his grandfather. He built a house called West Bank House overlooking Ingtham Hall. Um, the grandfather was so distressed that he closed up the estate and moved to a nearby village. Uh, the family eventually reconciled, however, um, and uh, uh, the grandfather grew to uh, love his new son-in-law and all his uh, grandchildren. And I think uh, Charlton being named after his grandfather, Demetrius, is symbolic of that, that healing of that uh, break in in the family. Uh, Charlton's father died when he was uh, nine years old and his mother then moved from Rotham to Richmond, a uh, uh, suburb of London. Uh, Charlton was the only child of the six of his siblings then living at home. So he lived there with his mother and the servants. Um, Charlton 
continued to attend school in London. Um, he also sang as a choir boy in St. Paul's uh, Cathedral. At the age of 17, um, he was um, um, joined uh, the College of King's College in London in the Department of Applied Sciences. Um, it's not clear that he ever earned the degree there, but he was accepted into the program. At that same time, he also became a student of a civil engineer, Sir John Hawkshaw, um, and for three years studied under Hawkshaw. Hawkshaw was a very eminent uh, civil engineer in London. And at the end of that three year period, Charlton himself was inducted into the institution of civil engineers in England. So the point of all that is his credentials as a civil engineer are very solid. He did everything that you needed to do to have those credentials as a civil engineer. And so that's what he was trained as. Um, most civil engineers at that time did not set up independent practice. However, they were usually hired by railroads or canals. Um, and beginning in the 1880s by architectural firms started to hire engineers onto their staff. And that's what Charlton did, but he didn't do it in England because at that time prior to um, being hired by anybody, he moved from England to Detroit. Why he came to Detroit is unknown. He had no personal connections here. Um, he, he would go on to work with a number of English born and uh, raised uh, um, architects in Detroit, but it's not clear that he knew them before going there. He probably came to Detroit because he could come to Canada as a British citizen. Detroit at the time was the second largest city, American city on the Canadian border after Buffalo. It was about you know, 80,000 people, and that ranked at about 20,000 people above Toronto, Canada's largest. So he could freely come into Canada and then move to a, a right next door to Windsor to a great American metropolis. And then he began working in Detroit almost immediately. His, his first two years, however, in the Detroit-Windsor area are kind of a mystery. It's not clear who he worked for, but by 1879, he had joined the, uh, uh, the view of Detroit there, to join the staff of uh, Gordon um, Alloyd, one of the most prominent architects in Detroit and in Michigan at the time. And he worked for, for Lloyd for about two years as a, a draftsman as, assistant uh, architect. Um, uh, Lloyd was also um, born in England. He had been raised in Canada, but he had returned to England um, for his training. Um, so working for a very prominent architect, Charlton was developing a name for himself, really, really uh, advancing rather quickly up the um, architectural ladder in Detroit. Um, following his time with Lloyd, um, Charlton accepted a position as the architect of the Detroit School Board. Um, so he was in charge with any architectural work done in any uh, Detroit schools for about a year. Um, and during that time, he designed his first ever building the Irving School on Willis Avenue in Detroit, uh, pictured uh, here. Um, his time uh, with the school board ended rather abruptly. I think you know this was the era of kind of patronage for such positions. Probably a new school board was voted in, so Charlton was out. He set up his own practice briefly, but within a few months, he had joined another architectural firm, that of Edward Brown. And he worked as the office superintendent and chief draftsman there for Brown. Not a lot is known about Brown. He was of Scottish ancestry, not as prominent as Lloyd, but, but Charlton had a very prominent position um, in the firm. He was there for uh, a few years, and then he joined the very prominent firm of Scott and Company. Here are some of Scott's works in the Detroit area. Scott did buildings not only in Detroit, but throughout the state. And uh, uh, Charlton's position with the Scott firm was probably fairly high because in 1887, when they needed to dispatch someone to Marquette to oversee um, the construction of the branch prison, um, which uh, uh, Scott had won uh, the uh, right to build, uh, Charlton came up to Marquette to, uh, to do that. Um, before getting on to the rest of his career, just a note on uh, Charlton's personal life during that, uh, this time. While he was in Detroit in 1884, he returned to uh, England briefly to marry his first uh, cousin, um, Rosa uh, Thompson. Um, they returned to Detroit where about a year later she bore him a son, but unfortunately uh, died from complications of the childbirth. Uh, Charlton's son um, was sent to England then to be looked after by his mother and possibly his mother's wife, who was Charlton's uh, aunt, of course. Um, 
and uh, Charlton carried on then in Detroit. But two years later, he married his second wife, um, uh, Alice Grills, pictured here uh, with Charlton's eldest son, uh, the son uh, from his first uh, uh, um, marriage. Um, Alice was also an English uh, immigrant. Um, uh, she had moved to uh, Detroit with her mother and all her siblings. Um, and her brother Maxwell was also an architect who worked in some of the same firms that Charlton did. So it's likely that's how Charlton got to know Alice because he was working with uh, her brother Maxwell. Um, Alice and Charlton uh, moved up to Marquette, of course, in 1887. And along with them came Alice's mother, uh, her sister, and her younger brother all came to Marquette at the same time. Um, so it's interesting that Charlton's first marriage would have been uh, to a first cousin, um, and none of them would have had any real family in the Detroit area, but all of a sudden, Charlton marries into the uh, Grills family, and um, he's got uh, on his doorstep a mother, a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law, and then within the same state, another brother-in-law who worked in the same profession. So this extended group of English expatriates, and that might have something to do with um, you know, Charlton's character because after his death, it was noted that you would never have mistaken him for anything but an Englishman. Um, and I think being married to an English woman and, and this whole, this extended English family helped to preserve um, uh, that English character. Um, so Charlton's up in Marquette. He's over, overseeing the design of the branch prison for the Scots. Uh, he oversees a number of other projects for them as well, including the first building at the Mission in College of Mines in Houghton, the Gogeba County Courthouse, a number of other residential and commercial properties. In 1889, the firm, the office in Marquette is renamed Scott and Charlton. And a year after that, in 1890, um, the partnership is dissolved uh, amicably with the Scots and Charlton goes out on his own, opens his own office and, uh, and, and his career as a lone architect is, um, is launched. He works alone as an architect for about a year, but he, uh, after that, he takes on a partner, a William Gilbert. And for the rest of the time he's in practice, he always had at least partner, uh, at least one partner, uh, often two. And here's just a quick uh, office chronology, and I won't get into the details of who all those partners were and, and so on and so forth. But again, he always had a partner. And the partner rarely worked with him in the Marquette office because soon after taking on Gilbert as a partner, Gilbert left to open a branch office for the firm. Um, the, the, the firm had branch offices from then on uh, until uh, the office closed in 1918. The, the first few were, were kind of little ones and probably weren't designed to be permanent, one at Houghton, one at Sault Ste. Marie, but the first big branch office, the one they had high hopes for was in Superior. Um, how, however, that one didn't last very long, probably due to the financial panic of the 1890s. Why Superior, Wisconsin? Well, Superior was a lot bigger than Marquette. Um, it's still on Lake Superior. It's not that far away. It's on the doorstep of Detroit, uh, of uh, Duluth, which was even bigger. So I think Charlton was trying to branch out. He was so successful. The firm was so successful in the UP that they felt they could branch out and, and, and go to, to, to a, a bigger metropolis. Again, that one didn't work out as well, but about a year after that, they opened another branch office, this time in Milwaukee, which is even you know, far bigger than, than Duluth was and many, many times bigger than uh, Marquette. So somewhat surprising that um, this little firm in Marquette, this, this rural city was opening branches in these uh, metropolises. Um, uh, but it was successful. The Milwaukee branch lasted until the firm closed until 1918. Not a lot is known. I haven't been able to find all that much information about what the, what the firm designed in Milwaukee. I definitely have discovered some uh, structures, some fairly prominent public buildings, Milwaukee and environs, um, um, and um, uh, some nice uh, residences and, uh, and uh, a few small commercial structures as well. Um, Charlton uh, you know, was a professional architect. He had all the credit as a civil engineer, now having worked with prominent firms, and he really saw himself as a professional. And the title of this presentation and of my forthcoming book, Architectural Missionary, comes from a quote from Charlton, where he, he described to the American Institute of Architects, of which he was a member, in a letter he said once that, we are somewhat in the position as missionaries to the profession in this district. 
where the architect and builder still hold sway and, and we are trying to advance the cause of the profession of architecture. And again, I'm not gonna get into a lot of, get into the weeds here about how the office functioned and, and why he was a professional compared to others. Um, I, I'll leave that to, to my book, which you can buy hopefully sometime uh, later this year. Um, so uh, uh, Charlton, uh, again, just to wrap up his, his life story here in 1918, he closed uh, the office, retired from architecture because of World War I, all building activity has ceased. Um, um, he didn't remain dormant, however, uh, within, uh, by the next year, he had opened uh, a photo enlarging shop in Marquette. He was an avid photographer, a deep interest in photography. He opened that shop and that lasted until the late uh, 1930s, that, that second career of his. Um, he died in, in 1941 uh, after uh, several months illness. He died at home uh, in his home on, on Ohio Street in Marquette. So that's uh, just a quick review of his life. Um, and I don't know how much time we have used up here uh, so far. I'll try to speed through the rest of this. And if I need to get cut off at any point, just, just cut me off. Um, Charlton, you've got, again- You've got about three minutes. Okay. Um, Charlton, uh, very prolific as an architect, designed 426 buildings. Um, of these, um, 108 were individually listed in that article that I got the 426 number from. Um, I've identified 170 more um, individual buildings. So of the 426, which is the number always given for what he had designed, uh, 278 have been identified. So about two thirds of his work has been identified. Over half are residential and commercial structures, the remaining are public buildings. State and government buildings make up 15% of the total. Um, he designed everything from houses, commercial structures, everything, uh, prominent public buildings, uh, uh, a pedestal for a statue, a counter for a federal building, anything you needed from an architect, Charlton would design for you. So he didn't specialize in any one type of building he designed at all. Again, uh, the state of Michigan, a very prominent client that brought him to the UP designing the prison. He designed or supervised the, the building by Scott on the campus, the first one. He would design the remaining um, uh, six structures over the next 15 years or so. He designed additional structures at the Market Branch Prison. Also another state institution uh, uh, built in the UP at the time, Northern. He designed uh, the original structures for that. And then his uh, largest work, uh, the uh, uh, Upper Peninsula Hospital for the Insane at Newberry, which was uh, 30 structures built over a, a, a nearly a 20 year uh, period. Um, and that's his, his, again, his largest uh, single work. Schools, he did 80 of them um, in the UP. Um, not all high schools, some are just little grammar schools, but 80 schools. So on average, he was designing a new school building somewhere in the UP every six months throughout his career. Again, a lot of other smaller little projects. One little one of, of great prominence was the, the mining exhibit at, um, at uh, the Chicago Exposition. And uh, uh, Michigan had a, a being what it was, its place in mining had a, a great deal of acreage in the mining building there and the, the largest exhibit in Charlton designed that. As you can see, it featured a great uh, triumphal arch of Lake Superior sandstone. And uh, that's something Charlton is known for uh, working with this uh, incredible building material. Um, and uh, um, even after it had fallen out of fashion by other architects, Charlton continued to work um, in, uh, in Lake Superior Sandstone. So how are we on time? We're doing okay. If you can just wrap things up within the next minute or two, we're fine. Okay, well, I, I have many, many slides, but so I'm gonna just race through these and just make a quick commentary on his styles. Charlton, very uh, typical of his period. He worked in all the styles that were prominent, um, but he wasn't a plagiarist. He wasn't a hack. He was very um, innovative and very adaptive. He could take the latest style that had become popular in America and, uh, and, and design a building in it for his uh, client clients. Um, uh, during this period, um, American architecture went from the high Victorian period to the late Victorian period. So basically from the picturesque styles into the more academic ones. And we see this evolution throughout Charlton's career. Um, all the early buildings, the prominent ones were in Richardsonian Romanesque. 
the prison, uh, Gogeba County Courthouse, uh, Michigan Tech, um, uh, the Ely School in Marquette, one of the, the, the next school after that Irving School in Detroit he designed in the Romanesque style, Ishpeming City Hall, the City Hall in Escanaba, the Marquette Waterworks, um, the Wilkinson Block in Marquette, uh, the Marquette Opera House, all the Romanesque style. Um, in um, the Longyear House as well. And then he, for domestic work at the time, it was off in the Queen Anne, the shingle style um, that you saw him designing for his clients. And then after this, he transitioned into the classical revival style. So again, that move from the picturesque into the academic style. And the academic could include very academic Roman to Georgian revival, colonial revival, but we see this again uh, wrapping up his career. And, you know, if I could, you know, if you whisk back up here and look at some of these, you know, picturesque styles, very vibrant, uh, silhouette, very important, a lot of decorative detail to the later academic styles, flat roofs, uh, uh, the ornamentation much more, um, much more restrained. Um, but I will leave it at that and take any questions that uh, I might have or you might have. So right now we don't have any questions. We'll, we will have time at the end for those. If okay. the audience does have questions, you can type them into the Q&A section. And I'll read them at uh, the end of Jack's presentation. So Jack Dio is our second presenter today. Uh, Jack is also a photographer, as was our, our, the subject of our last presentation. Jack is a 1975 graduate of Northern and has been operating the Superior View Photography in Marquette for a while since, uh, let's see, about a um, little over 40 years. Is that right, Jack? Uh, 78, so it's about 42. Yep. Okay. And I've seen already a couple of presentations in or a couple of the photos that have been in the presentations today during this symposium, I know are available through your um, photography shop too. Yeah. I noticed the, the and, one- And I've worked with Steve and uh, a lot of your presenters. I did have a quick question for Steve though. Sure. I can ask it right now. Yeah. Uh, what, what was still around from the Charlton archive of photography or sketches, uh, the photographs you said he took, did any of that survive? There's only a handful in, uh, you know, at the Market County Historical Society working through the collections there. Every now and then one will come up that either has his name on it or the record will note that it was donated by him to the Historical Society. So okay. all of that was apparently lost. Nothing mm -hmm. was preserved, just like all his architectural records and drawings. There, there are some that survived, but in scattered collections, nothing got saved of his. Um, and then the Holy Grail was I'll just, I'll wrap it up here, but he referenced once he, he kept a scrapbook of all the articles about him that appeared anywhere in all his buildings and searches through the descendants have not turned that up. Oh my goodness. Yeah. One more comment too. Uh, I thought it was interesting that he designed a lot of uh, the Huron Mountain Club cabins too. So it wasn't just big, huge buildings. He did little cabins also. No, he did. He, he even did a workers' cottages for CCI. So from the, the robber baron mansions down to a workman's cottage. Very good. I guess I should start to share my screen. See how that goes. Okay. Uh, share. And, uh, hmm. I got a launch meeting thing up here, dialogue. Yeah, so there are two ways to fix it. One is to just browse to the screen that you wanted uh, and, and it would still show. The other way to do it would be to back out and then um, share your screen and connect directly to the document that you're after. Are you looking for the, the one that's on Keynote? Yeah, yeah. I. Uh... Okay, now I see it there. Let's see if I hit play. Are you seeing it? Yep. Good, good. All right. Uh, you know, I wanted to start with a thank you to the Sonderager family. Um, I took this picture of Marion Sonderager at a Glacier Glide event. That was an art, outdoor art show we used to have. 
And I think she's showing us the secret to a long life here, uh, skiing and, uh, and staying young. But I had a lot of great experiences with Marion over the years. She was a frequent visitor to my studio and uh, encouraged my uh, love of history. So I wanted to just give her a little plug in the Sonderager family for everything they do. Um, now, anybody who wants to do a story on Northern in the 1970s, uh, you might want to see me. That's uh, me in front of the dorm, Hunt Hall. And I, I just thought I'd let you know that I'm zooming about 200 yards away from this exact spot. Uh, I live in North Marquette now, right off of Wright Street and uh, Sugarloaf Road. So I can almost see my dorm still. And uh, I just thought I'd let anybody, uh, all the researchers know that if you need shots of uh, Northern life in the 1970s, let me know. See, I'm, I'm known for providing photographs, not really for the research. So I just wanted to, to get that in there. But we're going to start, you know, and I always like to talk about the photographers uh, that uh, created the photos you're about to see. And this is the, uh, the photography tent of Adolf Peterson and his brother. They were Gwyn photographers. And uh, I used to advertise quite heavy for collections back in the 1980s. And I had two major collections come out of Gwyn. And this show is gonna be based on, actually there's three, but this was the Peterson collection that I got in the 1980s. This tent was a wonderful thing for, uh, for traveling and taking portraits all over the UP. You can see the beautiful skylight uh, and, and diffuse light that they got inside this tent. But it wasn't uh, very long before they had a really beautiful studio in Gwynn. This is the Peterson Brothers Photography Studio. Uh, you can see the big skylight up at the top. And uh, this is, in fact, you can also see maybe a couple of the photographs that were displayed in that little cabinet. Um, but this building is still there today, which is kind of interesting. It's changed quite a bit. I'll go back and you can see it, the doorway still has the fancy little curls there. And you can see where windows came and went. But uh, this is the Peterson Brothers uh, photography studio. Uh, but they must have done really well for themselves because there was a Peterson block also in Gwynn. Uh, here you see the ice cream, candy, and cigar sign of the Peterson block. And here's another view of it. I think this is in the 1940s. So I got all the glass plates of the Peterson uh, brothers collection back then. And then another call I got was about a collection of uh, George Jackson. George Jackson was the superintendent of the Gwynn Mine for CCI. And uh, just an incredible archive of photographs uh, were in a bunch of boxes that somebody called me up and I went to Gwynn. And uh, actually this glass plate was uh, taken in Ishpeming at the Child's Art Gallery. Child's did a lot of the photography work for Cleveland Cliffs and about anybody who was anybody wanted their photos taken at Child's Art Gallery. And I just found this negative just recently of George, but the whole history of his family was in these boxes. And this is a, uh, the school of Lackawanna in Pennsylvania. The, the Jacksons were from Scranton and that's George in the front row, far left. And this was known as a mining school. A lot of these guys trained to be miners and mining engineers. Uh, so George Jackson came from a, a family that was uh, uh, into mining. And here's a shot of the CCI directors almost a hundred years ago. It's dated 9-13-20. George is in the far back row, second from the right, the real tallest one there. Uh, in the front row, you got both William G. Mather and Sam Mather, uh, a few of the other people in the picture to the bottom right is uh, Mr. Duncan, another superintendent. Uh, another interesting person that people have done research is Charlie Stakel, uh, the young man in the far back row, second from the left. Charlie Stakel wrote a book, Reminiscence, uh, his reminiscence of the Iron Country and amazing uh, stuff of Barnes Hecker. So a lot of my photos came from this Jackson uh, collection. That's the, his house in Gwynn, the superintendent's house. And that's uh, where all these photographs that I was lucky enough to acquire came out of that house. Also in the Jackson uh, collection was letters from Warren Manning. Uh, the landscape designer of Gwynn from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, dated October 27th, 1909. You can see one copy went to Mather, one went to Jackson, Duncan, and then Mr. Harrison. Um, 
what was with this uh, letter was 24 photographs taken of Gwyn in 1909. And I'm using some of these in uh, the show you're about to see here. But uh, this is another uh, bonus to the Jackson collection was getting these uh, uh, things from Manning. And every page and every number of the photographs was a detailed record of uh, everything from what trees were going to be planted to what kind of uh, materials were used in the roads. Uh, and uh, it, it's just a, a great record uh, of, of the building of Gwyn. And Gwyn, of course, was called Model Town. They, they planned Gwyn before it was built, and that's what Model Town uh, meant. So uh, kind of a, a different thing when they could build before. One other collection I ended up with are glass plates. You can see how large this plate is, 11 by 14 inches. These were all negatives taken by CCI. They're dated and numbered. Uh, some of them are as early as 1906 and go right into the 1920s. But the Child's Art Gallery were photographers for CCI and I imagine they took some of these photographs. Um, you know, mining started in that area in the Swansea district about 1872. These two photographs came out of Gwyn. Uh, they were in the Jackson collection. And I really do think they're from that very beginnings of 1870 because you can see they're using candles on their heads. Um, this is another shot taken at the same time. Uh, this is a great shot because not only you got the guy with the big pickaxe up in the air, you see the, th uh, the three-man drilling or right here, just maybe a two-man drilling where he's hitting a, a drill bit sideways with the candle on his head. So these are the earliest shots that I came upon uh, of, of Gwyn. And of course, CCI got involved in 1902 and they started building Gwyn about 1906, but they had to move uh, the Escanaba River, the middle branch of the Escanaba River. They wanted to make sure that mines wouldn't flood. They wanted to make sure when the town was built, there was an ore under the town. All this was kind of to, to make sure they didn't have any mistakes, but amazing uh, work to move a river. And these are also shots out of the Jackson private snapshots. I mean, I got boxes of shots that he took even before the first tree was cut. Jackson was there photographing Gwen. Uh, but you can see what a monumental task it was to move, uh, remove a river like that. Here's some more shots, even in the winter having to work. And uh, you can see this one too, a lot of labor involved in, uh, in the planning and building of Gwyn. Uh, these were also interesting shots. You see uh, Sinking a Shaft, the foundation company uh, of New York. I think it says something, Nassau Street, New York. Shaft sunk through quicksand. So I guess they were advertising that they could uh, sink a shaft anywhere at any time. And these are interesting shots of some of the first shafts being built by CCI uh, in the Gwyn area. Now, these are some of the CCI uh, negatives. Uh, this is, there was quite a few mines in Gwyn. Uh, this is the Francis mine. This picture was taken in 1911. Uh, we have the Gwyn mine. This is also 1911. This is the Stevenson mine. This photograph was made in 1914. Look at the clarity. Again, these are 11 by 14 negatives. You see the horse wagon. Uh, you can look and see so much going on in these shots. Uh, this is the Princeton mine taken in 1906. Again, I think the Princeton was one of the very early mines, probably where they were sinking those shafts I just showed you. And then just here's another one of the Austin location. Uh, this was taken in uh, 1906. But you know, of any town, there must be more photographs of Gwyn because it was a model town. They photographed almost everything being built uh, in every stage. This is Austin location in 1904, and you can see the construction of the houses. Uh, and there's a lot of information about uh, upper class houses or class uh, houses that were double built and who were they were built for. All this information is on some of these plates. This here is Carbon Street in 1910. And you can see construction going on. Even that one in the foreground still has some windows to be put in. This is the Mackinac Gardner location. 
1919. This is Pine Street, 1917. And you can see now some old cars appearing in some of these shops. So some later day work. The, the, the building of Gwyn went on for quite a few years. Uh, this is one of Manning shots, and I like this one. This is the alley, and everybody had this little outbuilding in their alley. Uh, and if you go into Gwyn, uh, a couple of these are still there. Uh, I went down this alley looking to see if I could see any of this, and, and you can spot a couple of them uh, that are still being used or uh, still in Gwyn today. This is actually uh, the building at the superintendent's house, and this is George Jackson's father. Uh, he ended up living in Gwyn. Um, him and his wife, Jackson's parents, were both Civil War veterans, and also in that box was their entire collection, uh, including a Civil War diary, uh, all the photographs taken of different generals, but that's George Jackson's father, and uh, they, they had a little outbuilding there too at the superintendent's building. Now you're looking at some of the main buildings here. You're looking uh, straight at the clubhouse uh, under construction, uh, the Methodist church on the left and the hospital on the right. Um, let's see if I got a, another shot here. Yeah, there we go. Now it's completed the uh, a little further along and some kids posing in the street. The, uh, the clubhouse, um, was built, uh, let's see if I got that here. No, I think 1908, uh, it had a bowling alley. It had a tennis court, uh, skating area, swimming pool, billiards. So they had these beautiful facilities for their workers, which is a real plus for CCI. Uh, to make life better for these miners was the whole idea. This is a beautiful shot of the clubhouse. Um, I talked to Steve a few weeks ago and had no idea that Charlton built and designed or designed most of these buildings in Gwyn. So I learn something every time I do a project like this too. Uh, and I imagine you're getting a, a kit kind of look into some of these buildings. There's the hospital. Um, the hospital had a capacity of about 15 uh, uh, people at one time or 15 uh, rooms. And then the Methodist church over on the left too. From the roof of the clubhouse, now you're looking at, uh, this would be uh, Maple Street, from the roof of the clubhouse. And that big house on the right is the doctor's residence. Uh, another shot now to the right of this taken uh, from the roof is Jasper Street. And you can see the stable that was connected uh, to the doctor's office. And of course, uh, Manning described everything down to the lattice fence and everything that was going to be used in the building of these. But these are a couple of uh, interesting bird's eye view taken from the courthouse. Uh, the bank was uh, completed in 1908. This is a real early shot of the bank in Gwyn. Uh, this is actually a mounted photograph I came upon that is also of the bank. The sign's not up on it yet. Uh, and here's one taken. These are now taken by Adolf Peterson. You can see his uh, initials in the corner of the photograph in his copyright symbol. And this is the Gwynn Savings Bank. And another shot of it in the winter. So a lot of photos taken of all these buildings through all the stages. This is the quail block in Gwynn. Uh, and you can see uh, the dentist office there uh, directly in front. Here's another shot of it. Uh, the store windows, you can see it had must have had like a department store in there. And the post office. And uh, in the far distance there, you can see the, uh, the high school, but we'll get a little closer look. Here's the uh, Gwyn City Band playing a little number out in front of the, uh, the quail block. Unless that's the hotel. That might be the hotel now that I'm looking at it. Does that seem right, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. There's the bank, there's the hotel, and then way down uh, at the end of the street, you see the high school. But you can see this is a glass plate. You even see the broken corner of it. But just such clarity uh, from these plates. Here is the hotel in the winter. <clears throat> and even an interior of the hotel staff. Uh, I like looking at this. You got the cooks and you got uh, all the people. You can see they sell cigars. And I imagine they had some chew 
because if you look at the floor, you're going to see uh, one, two, three, four spittoons waiting for your uh, for your pleasure in the lobby. And there's a beautiful shot of the high school uh, quite a bit later because you can see the ivy that have grown up on it. But I imagine this too was a Charlton design. Uh, here they're building the town hall. This is 1914 Pine Street. And uh, here's another interesting shot that shows you the Peterson Photography Studio. And then in the distance, the, uh, the quail block and the bank. Uh, if you're in Gwynn today and, and look at this scene, this is pretty much what you're gonna see. Uh, it's almost in the same spot. Um, the fire hall wasn't built yet, but you can see there's the photography studio and uh, the bank. There is the fire hall and uh, the clock tower still doesn't have the clock in it yet when this picture was taken. But then here you can see the clock is now in it. Another shot taken in the winter. And another little later day shot of Gwyn from an old postcard where you can see the fire hall, Quail's block, the bank. This is the, uh, the railroad station in Gwyn. I'm not sure what line this was. I, didn't get enough time to figure this out. But I don't know if it had a clock tower eventually too. You can see the two circles up there. But this is one of the railroad stations in Gwynn. And then a lot of construction scenes of the bridges and different bridges. I don't know if this is a flood going on here or what, but uh, there were some real pretty shots of Gwynn and the children and the dogs all playing in a beautiful scene at Gwynn, Michigan here. And then we're getting near the end here and a big celebration when it was time to celebrate the beginnings of Gwyn. Uh, this snapshot was in the George Jackson collection. It's not backwards. Um, it's just the sign. You're, you can see it from the back, ice cream sodas. So it was a big day for Gwyn when they had this parade. And uh, I know this is right because on the little circle on the far right, you can see the sign for the post office. So, um, and then this shot here, I think, is an amazing one. Another parade shot. MWA, first parade, September 5th, 1910. This MWA was the modern woodman of America. And that was a fraternal sort of a benefit group started in 1883. And uh, these are some of the members of the, uh, of the, of the group. And you can see they're celebrating Gwyn. And again, the clarity, just to take a little section of this and look at the men marching. This is from the same glass plate. And, and again, I, I learn something every time I do a project like this, because now that I see those men in the background, I have lots of portraits of, quote, foresters and men posing in the studio with these same badges and looking uniforms. So I learned a lot about MWA when I uh, put this show together. Let's see how we're doing here. I think I just got a couple more. Yeah, just a couple more shots of the Kendall's gas station in Gwynn. Gwynn in the 1940s. And another shot, a later day shot, showing what was the photography studio is now an auto garage. And in 1980, I got the negatives out of that building. I got a call from a Mr. Wallamacki. He ran that service station. And those glass plates were still in their original boxes in the original crates in that building right there that uh, you see on the far left. So I've been a very lucky collector and uh, I feel real privileged to uh, be able to share these photographs and work with so many great historians. Uh, I'm gonna end with one of my favorite shots of the old swimming hole in Gwynn. Uh, this was taken in 1921 and uh, to have the Escanaba River running right through the town uh, was I'm sure a treat for the kids and for everybody. So that's about it from my slideshow. I always let the photos do the talking. Um, and I can unshare my screen here. And how did I do time-wise? Eh, not too bad. You did great.
<laughs> okay, we good. actually have a few minutes for questions and answers from the audience. If you have anything, you can type it into the Q&A. And um, while, while we're waiting to see if we're going to get any participant questions, I'd like to ask one. Um, so Steve, you're, you're writing this book about Charlton. Is there anything that really surprised you about him or his architecture as you were researching it? Um, I ha I've been researching him for so long because <laughs> this was my master's thesis nearly a quarter century ago. So I don't think there were any real surprises. Um, I, I guess the most recent surprises are because of the ability for um, you know, searching documents that didn't exist years ago where I've been able to bring to light um, uh, new buildings. You know, every new building I would discover is a surprise. And, and many of the dozens that I found in recent years have been the result of, you know, being able to, to search through newspaper collections electronically. And then some of the genealogical data as well. You know, the, the thing about his, you know, his mother marrying the tenant farmer on the estate, that, that really only came about because of, uh, the ability to do, you know, ancestry.com and really begin to dig into um, that type of material. You know, Charlton's first wife just sort of fell off the radar. Um, you, she's never referenced, even when his son, his son's obituary doesn't say he was the son of that woman. Um, every now and then it'll be referenced that that was his stepmother, but there's really no indication that you know, Charlton had been married before. And, and again, it was electronic searching that allowed all that to happen. And so those are the surprises that that, that come up, but uh, um, nothing um, as far as you know a new design that's really bizarre or, or out of his wheelhouse. It's all it's all you know pretty typical of, of what he designed. Every new design that comes up. So. And that that issue of finding finding documents and making them accessible is certainly one that um, that is important to me. So I'm the the Dean for Library and Instructional Support at, at Northern, which includes the archives. And so our archivist, Marcus Robbins, has mm -hmm. been uh, leading a project and has had some federal grant support to, um, to work on making the historical records from around the UP more accessible. Because we look at those small historical societies that have been preserving their small communities records and their manuscripts, their histories, some of those are hanging on by threads. And so Marcus has been really working very carefully to go out and visit each one of them to find out what they have to help them. And um, he's, he's working on a grant project to um, hopefully get those get us to the point where we have the resources to digitize more of those mm -hmm. and then feed them into the um, Digital Public Library of America project so that they're easily findable. Yeah, well, that's where, you know, you, you know, some of Jack's collection is available electronically. You can search on the internet through his material, but a lot of historical societies, <laughs> you, you can only access their stuff by visiting them every other Saturday when they're open. <laughs> right, and, and, and whether or not they have what you want is you have almost no idea. Yeah, and they is. may not even know what right. all they have because they have um, they have just amazing collections sometimes, but they have no, I, no idea it's there. Right. And, do it. and I mean, I would I would give my eye teeth to get the mining journal um, digitized to a, a, allow a search of that incredible record of of the UP. We're, we're working on it. We don't have a <laughs> timeline for it, but we are working on it. We do have um, Cloverland accessible now. So Cloverland is digitized and available, which is the old um, kind of promotional newsletter for the Upper Peninsula to encourage people to move here. Let's see, I don't have any questions from the audience yet. Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's more of a comment, and I think uh, Steve mentioned about Charlton's interest in photography mm -hmm. and the, the Marquette enlarging shop. I think it'd be interesting uh, to let the viewers know here about his relationship with George Shiras, who, of mm -hmm. course, a book just came out by uh, uh, Jim McCommons. Um, 
And, and just recently, I came upon some of the 1930 Shiras prints, and they were stamped right on the back, Marquette Photo Enlarging Shop. So Shiras and uh, and Charlton were, were good friends. There's even a picture of Charlton out at the uh, Peter White camp. And I think that's amazing that the connection now with Shiras and Charlton uh, has been discovered. Right. And it's, uh, there aren't many details of, about it, you know, and it appears it was, it was really Charlton printing those images for him. And mm -hmm. um, some of them are even, they're, they're, the copyright on them are D. Fred Charlton on Shiras's mm -hmm actual prints. So obviously they, they had a close working relationship and Shiras trusted Charlton to, you know, produce the prints of, of, of these photos he was taking. Right. And, uh, yeah. Uh, one, another thing we hope for more information about, um, uh, uh, yeah, that picture of Charlton at the Peter White camp is really interesting. And because of digital searching, I, I recently discovered in the last year, Charlton was an avid hunter. He, he went out west in the 1880s to hunt in Colorado for two months. So he and the, the writer at the Free Press just delighted in this article about Charlton's stories about cowboy life out, out west. And just wow. prior to his first marriage, he spent a month hunting um, in England with peers and celebrities. He was on, on some, you know, Lord's Great Estate and a hunting party there. So he was this, this great hunter. So from right, the Peter amazing. White camp to like Downton Abbey, you know, he was on, <laughs> on the hunt over there. <laughs> That's great. So I, I just finished, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago that I finished Jim's book, uh, Camera Hunter, about Cyrus. The great book that I highly recommend. It's interesting, the, uh, the sessions, the Sonderager sessions that, that I've watched today, how these threads of history tie together when we had the, the session right before you talking about native and invasive species and thinking about Cyrus's relationship to the preservation of migratory birds and then the connection with, with um, Charlton and the architecture of the courthouse where Teddy Roosevelt had his libel trial <laughs> and all of these things just really tie in together so, so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's history. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a great photo, I don't know if it showed up today, of I just, Library of Congress has, I, don't, I just saw it for the first time in the, the last few years of an interior shot of Roosevelt in the courtroom during that trial. Oh. And, and if you search on the Library of Congress uh, website, you, you'll find it quite easily. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to put it in my book, but you know, I had to you know, limit the, the, the photos to actually Charles <laughs> building, not Teddy in, in, in his, the courtroom he, he designed, but so rare those interior shots and here's, you know, President Roosevelt right there on, on, that, on that bench testifying. So, yeah. so I'll give, uh, while we're waiting for the, the next presenters to show up and so that I can hand over the baton, I will uh, give a plug for a class or our last uh, session about native, native and um, invasive species. One of the presenters is Dr. Jill Leonard, who's a fish biologist at Northern. She's working with, um, Tamir Cleary and faculty in art and design that have developed a class about the relationship between science and art. And so I actually um, am, am looking forward to seeing what, what they do with that. I know I just, gave, um, I just gave Jill my copy of Camera Hunter because it ties in some of those same themes that they'll be working on. She, she did tell me though that lots of people have been giving her lots of things, especially in Marquette, where we can easily tie together science and history and art and it all does blend together so well. Hmm. 